And here is the Easy UHF transmitter from Immersion RC. This is uh, 500 milliwatts of power. And again, we've got a nice metal case. It's pretty important with these transmitters to make sure they don't spew unwanted stuff out, unwanted transmission, spurious emissions they're called. It has a high and low power setting. I think the low is a couple hundred milliwatts. The high is 500 milliwatts or so. So there's not a lot of difference there, but it might be enough to get you out of trouble. Has an SMA connector for the antenna. I think that's SMA. Yes, it's SMA connector for the antenna. And we've got a little fail safe bind button on the bottom end here we've got quite a few more connections than on some of the other uhf transmitters we've got our dc input now that is from 9 to 12 volts quite a narrow range quite a narrow range so we'll have a look inside and see why that might be we've got our uh, what's that uh, rctx that goes off to our transmitter head tracking unit a usb connector there uh, probably for flashing i'm not sure i haven't looked at the instructions yet and then we've got an auxiliary there which i have no idea what that's for but we'll look at that when we come to the function of the system but first of all let's pull it apart let's see what's inside because that's going to be pretty important and i can tell by looking at this immediately that if i take the top screws off the board should slide out because there's nothing attached to that bottom panel so let's just do that a couple of phillips head screws very simple um, again it uses the same concept of an extruded case with some aluminum end plates and this is silver the shearer long range system the dragon link are black so you've got your color choices there if you want them so this should yeah there we go that just pulls right out as i said so there we go you're left with that extruded aluminium case put it to one side and let's have a bit of a look at what's inside this baby now here's the circuit board um, Thumbs up for having actually just the green solder mask so you can actually see where the component traces go. Don't like the black ones, do like the green ones. Let's just see a little bit more of what's going on. And um, we've got a buzzer in this one. We've got our microprocessor chip here. This is the, it's a PIC processor. The, most of the others are using Atmel. And this is a sort of a Chevy Ford choice. They all do the same job. Just different brand and a slightly different architecture between the two sets of chips but let's take a closer look let's look really closely at the board and see if we can figure out what's going on and what chips are being used all right so here's our microcontroller chip here's our buzzer and the real goodness starts down here with this little chip here now this we're gonna get it into shot this is a uh, what are they called a silicon labs si432 and this isn't what they call an ism transceiver it's a little it's all the goodies that you want wrapped up into one little component it produces a signal it'll operate from 400 megahertz up to about 900 megahertz i think so it's got a quite a wide frequency range it is a transmitter and a receiver hence the name transceiver and it does all the hard work associated with generating the radio frequency signal modulating it and um, interfacing to the microcontroller so this is where this differs a little bit from um, it was some interesting to see there's this three different ways of going about making these long range transmitters and this is different to the share long range share a long range fed the output of the little transceiver chip into a power amplifier chip this doesn't if we move down here you can see what's going on the output of this chip which is up to about 100 milliwatts is fed through some uh, components here some capacitors and inductors which basically tune it might take out all the rubbish you don't want and provide a good match of impedance to this little device here now this one is a pd8401 and it's a rf in channel mosfet that's a lot of rubbish you can't understand most of you but basically what it means is it's a transistor that amplifies the signal now this will do 100 milliwatts but the easy uhf claims to have an output of power of 500 milliwatts which is why they use a transistor here to boost that 100 milliwatts to 500 milliwatts and as i say that's just a different way of doing it this is the discrete approach and that explains remember i mentioned about the different voltages well the chip used by the shearer and most of them internally to the module of the dragon link um, they use the relatively low voltage components things that operate at about three to four volts so they work really well with a low voltage this system however because it's using a, a transistor mosfet it has to use a higher voltage because let's just go back a bit let's digress over here we've got the voltage comes in through your normal barrel connector comes through here and you'll notice there's a couple of regulators here these are just ordinary what we call linear regulators they just whack the top off the voltage and in doing so they create a bit of heat and so that means that we are going to be dropping our voltage down to three volts or 3.3 volts here so we can't afford to run high voltage or these would get too hot but also this this voltage goes off to our little chip here and off to our microcontroller but the transistor if we look carefully at where the voltage goes comes in and wanders around and it goes straight into that transistor so the transistor or the power output is reliant on having that narrow range of voltage 9 volts to 12 volts if we have too much voltage it could fry the transistor if we don't have enough voltage then the transistor itself may not be able to produce the required output so yeah there's no regulation that i can see on that 
voltage going to the power MOSFET, the output device. So, yeah, as long as you're running it within spec, you'll have no problems. But if you have a, you know, low, your LiPo starts going flat, you could find yourself losing a lot of power very quickly. It's not likely to happen. I mean, that's like saying if you pull the cord out, it won't work. I mean, you really, you know, you've got to assume that these things are going to be operated uh, within the specifications laid out for them. So it's not a problem. Anyway, the output of our transistor power amplifier, which can be 200 milliwatts or 500, depending on the setting of this switch over here, um, that goes through another matching circuit, and then it goes through a little switch here. Uh, looks like a little switch that goes off to the antenna. Let me have a look. I can't quite see this. Um, it goes through this device. Looks like it's a switch. I'll have to check that component later. If it's not, I'll tell you. And off to the antenna connector over here, the SMA connector for the antenna. So this is a pretty straightforward. It's, it's more old school. It's a little bit more old school than the uh, other systems because it's using a discrete transistor in the output stage. But having said that, there are some benefits to using a discrete transistor. If you turn this on without an antenna on it and it blows up, Odds are that it's just going to be this chip here, or this little transistor that blows. So repairs should be a whole lot easier and cheaper than having to replace a, a quad pack integrated circuit amplifier. So swings and roundabouts. Anyway, uh, construction looks reasonably good. Design looks reasonably good. I've got no, can't fault it in any real way. Um, it's a single sided load on the back. There's virtually nothing. Um, yep, uh, you know, what's to complain about? It certainly seems to do the trick. Obviously with this, little transistor here. These are rated to a maximum of one watt of power. So certainly it's not going to do the same power level as the Shearer long range system if you do the mods that are so obvious on the Shearer board. So this is always going to have a little bit less power, but it looks like it's going to have a fairly clean output. Certainly the, um, the filtering on the output it may not be quite as much as, although it seems to have a double pi output filter, so maybe it's good. I'll check it on the spectral analyzer, but certainly there's a lot of filtering between the little chip that creates the signal and the amplifier stage in that transistor. So yeah, I mean, Fairly good, no problems. You know, this, this UHF gear so far has been built to a pretty good spec and there's not a lot to complain about. Now here's the Immersion RC receiver, the one that I, I got with the transmitter and what does it say? It's the Easy UHF RX8 channel light. And again, it has a pretty narrow range of input voltages. It has 4.5 to 6 volts. That's not a hell of a lot actually. So you're gonna have to run this through a beck in most systems, make sure you get a reasonably good beck. Um, has a sensitivity of minus 112 decibels, which is pretty good, that's not bad. And, you know, um, it's a very, again, like the Shearer, it's a very thin receiver. Everything is now sort of, don't have these big coils we used to have on the old long wire systems. Everything is just spunked on a board, looks pretty good. We'll have to take this heat shrink off to have a look inside and see what is hidden under this little label. Let's do that. That's what happens on RC model reviews, just like Dave Jones's EEV blog. We don't just put stuff on the bench, we take it apart. And oh, this has got a sticker on it that's actually stuck to the board, which is, is this one? Yeah, why, are they st oh, why do they stick this to the board? What a pain in the backside. This has actually got a foam, it's got foam on here. It would probably not a silly idea because it does protect the board from being dinged. And yeah, it's probably not a bad idea actually, but I'm gonna have to peel this foam off to actually get inside and have a look and see what wonderful electronic -y goodness is hidden inside. So I'll do that off camera because I don't want to break anything. So there we go, there's all the goodness under that little foam pad. What have we got in here? Well, we've got that same chip, the um, Silicon Labs, four, was it? Oh, I wrote it down because I forget, for the 4432 four, or something, I forget what it is. Anyway, it's the same chip that's in the transmitter. Because that's a transceiver, it will actually act as a receiver as well as a transmitter. Now these do have diversity capabilities, but they're not being used because obviously we've just got one antenna, just an SMA connector there that we can plug an SMA lead into. So that just using the one antenna, like the Shearer light uh, in that regard. Uh, we've got our microprocessor, our microcontroller here. Actually, I'll have a look and see what that is. Yes, once again, they've used a PIC where most others use an Atmel. It makes no difference. It's just a different, you know, Chevy Ford thing. Don't worry about it. So yeah, that all looks pretty straightforward. We've got the USB there. Um, I, the thing I don't like about these little USBs sometimes is that they hang over the edge of the board. As you can see, a little bit proud of the board. So if you have a whack, quite often they can get knocked off. Um, it may not be an issue. I mean, you've got this SMA here as well to protect you from whacks there. So yeah, probably not complaining, I'm complaining about nothing there. But um, there's a crystal here, which is the main crystal, surface mount crystal. That's good because that's not going to get damaged. Um, no one uses stand-up crystals anymore. So really, you can see how simple these things are now. I mean, the, the signal comes in, goes into our little receiver chip, which sends out, spits out digital stuff into the microcontroller, which breaks it up into the channels. Oh, it's really quite simple. Now, this little chip down here is a Texas Instrument one. I don't have, I have no internet connection here at the workshop, so that's a bit of a pain sometimes. I can't look up the chips. I'm not familiar with that one, but it goes off to this little connector here, which is labeled OSD. I think, where's my little piece of thing? OSD Link it is, so um, I'm not quite sure what that chip's doing. But um, yeah, 
no, don't see any real reason to grizzle about this. It all looks really well made. The board design seems quite nice. There's nothing that's obviously going to fall off. It seems to be well designed. And these chips that they're using there, they have a claimed sensitivity, if I can find my homework that I wrote everything down on, they claim the sensitivity is between 101, uh, minus 101 and minus 121 decibels. So they're obviously using it about the middle of that, middle of that range with their claim of minus 112 decibels. I'll be talking about decibels a bit more uh, a little bit further on. We talk about things like link budgets in another part of this video series so you can work out which, in theory, will give you the maximum range. So there you go. That's uh, uh, not a bad looking bit of kit. And it seems that it's probably going to do the job fairly well. My only, perhaps my only real sort of mm, not too sure about is the front end here. There's a little bit of filtering, but there's not a lot of filtering. And if I look at the specifications for that chip, it doesn't have nearly the same performance as the one being used by Shira when it comes to handling blocking from adjacent frequencies. It's quite a bit inferior to the Shira chip in terms of that. So, and you know, this may be more susceptible to. Uh, slightly in-band and out-of-band strong signals. We'll be testing that on the bench when I do the bench test of these things. So just something to consider. This is probably, I would say the Shira system has probably better receiver performance in terms of resisting interference. But hey, that's the theory. Who knows what the practice will reveal.